and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 244, The Aleutian Campaign, The Kiska Blitz. Last time, the Japanese had successfully bombed Dutch Harbor on the eastern end of the Aleutian Island chain, while occupying Attu on the western end. However, the Battle of Midway, the entire reason for this diversionary action, did not go as Yamamoto had planned. Still, Japanese troops were on American soil. As the Japanese troops consolidated their hold of Attu, the natives were told that their lives would change little. Of course, they had to learn how to bow to the emperor during any ceremonies and bow to the Japanese commander. But other than that, they should get on with their lives. This ignored the fact that Foster Jones and his wife Etta, the island schoolteacher and nurse, were now gone. But the lives of the Aleuts did not go back to normal. They were never left unguarded, were only allowed to go out fishing occasionally, and even then had most of their catch taken from them. As they were rarely allowed to search for driftwood, the prisoners started tearing off sections of their homes for firewood. This way of life, miserable as it was, went on for months. But on September 14th of 1942, a Japanese coal carrier arrived in harbor. The 40-odd Aleuts were told they were being taken to Japan. Chief Mike complained, saying they were not causing trouble. But the decision had been made. The adults and children were forced aboard the smelly, dirty vessel that night. Most of them would never see Atu again, or leave Japan. Meanwhile, some 150 miles, or 240 kilometers southeast of Atu, was the island of Kiska. This equally desolate land had no native population, but there were humans there, men in uniform. The U.S. military, post Pearl Harbor, needed to know the weather in the western Pacific, because that would tell them what the weather in the eastern Pacific would be in the next few days. And as U.S. ships were no longer safe in the Pacific, the military decided to set up four weather stations on Attu, that had been Foster Jones' job, Atka, almost dead center of the entire island chain, Kanaga, just west of Atka, and Kiska. The man in charge of the Kiska weather team was William Charles House, or Charlie, to his friends. He and his nine-man team and their dog had arrived on Kiska on May 8, 1942. The information they gathered was sent to the U.S. Navy and the Army Air Force, as the Willowas, if not respected, could down a plane or sink a ship. But Charlie's team had another mission, one that involved not weather instruments, but antenna, as in the emerging technology that was radar. The disaster that was Pearl Harbor would not be repeated again. Team Charlie was to be stationed on Kiska for the next few years. The war would last at least that long, and the information they gathered was vital. But it was not to be. Just six days into their mission, on May 24th, a plane flew overhead. Now, the team had been told that the Japanese sometimes painted their planes to look like American ones, so they were taught to use the features of the plane to identify it. So, after checking with the emergency plane identification book, Charlie could say for certain that it was a Type 97 Yokosuka reconnaissance seaplane. The Americans called it a Glen. The enemy was nearby. Right away, Charlie radioed Dutch Harbor, but reminiscent of the radar team on the northern edge of Oahu, the radio operator on the other end did not believe Charlie. In disgust, he broke contact. But his crew believed him, so the weather team got busy, preparing for an attack. As they were practically weaponless, it was decided to, one, dig trenches, to have a relatively secure place in case of strafing, and two, they would take bundles of food and ammunition and hide them around the island, in case the enemy landed troops on Kiska. It wasn't perfect, but clearly no help was coming for some time. 
All this was done in a few days. Then, nothing. They went uninvaded for the next ten days. But then came the message that Dutch Harbor had been bombed the previous day. Charlie had the radio operator try to contact the harbor, but no one responded. Still, as the naval base and Fort Mears were so far away, clearly that Japanese force could not be anywhere near them. Maybe Charlie had misidentified the plane after all. The tension that had been building for the last few days disappeared. At 2 a.m. on June 7th, one of Charlie's hut mates, Walter Winfrey, started screaming, Attack! Attack! Charlie told him to go back to sleep, that he was having a bad dream. Winfrey shot back, Then what am I doing with a bullet hole in my leg? It was then the glass of the window shattered inward, and the sound of a machine gun could be clearly heard. Charlie and the third of the four hut mates, James Turner, dropped to the floor and quickly got dressed. Winfrey just rolled out of bed, now in greater pain. Turner got the stove ready, Charlie crawled over to the other room, brought back the secret code books, and together they destroyed all sensitive information. The last occupant, Madison Courtney, switched on the radio to report the attack. But before the device could warm up, enemy bullets ripped through his hand and the radio. With their secrets safely destroyed and the radio useless, there was no reason to stay inside the hut. And as the machine guns had gone silent, the men ran outside. Fortunately, the enemy's view of them was blocked by another hut. The men ran into the woods, but their boots hitting the ground got the attention of Captain Takiji Oni and his 1,200-man Special Naval Landing Force. The Japanese troops took up firing again, but by the time the Americans were 300 yards away, the fog had enveloped them completely. Coming upon the predetermined meeting place, some of the other men were waiting. James Turner and Gilbert Palmer told Charlie and his three hutmates to make a run for it. They would hold back the enemy with cover fire. In their panic, no further coordination was attempted. Charlie ran to the right, his comrades in another direction, and that would be the last he saw of them. To Charlie's thinking, the Japanese would destroy the weather station and then leave. There was literally nothing else man-made on the island. But what he did not know was that the occupation of Kiska, though temporary, was a part of Yamamoto's diversionary plan which meant soon there would be 3,750 more troops joining the 1,200 men who had just come ashore. Only when night came did Charlie come out of his hiding place, and now that he could move under the cover of darkness, he made straight for the stashed goods around the island. But what he would find is that the Japanese soldiers had fanned out and found every single one of their stashes. Charlie was alone, cold, and now had no food. A few days later, Charlie could only think of eating. Then he remembered what a fur trader had told him. There were no poisonous plants on Kiska. So the starving man picked up a puchik, or wild celery plant. The trader had been wrong, and in fact, puchik's leaves were poisonous. But fortunately, Charlie stripped them away and the outer layer before eating. It wasn't long before Charlie was forced to move further away from his recent settlement. Within days of the Japanese arrival, American planes were overhead, bombing the island's new owners. Between the bombs and the anti-aircraft fire of the enemy, Charlie's life was in even greater danger. With the Japanese troops in control of Atu and Kiska, for the first time since the War of 1812, foreign troops were occupying American soil. Between this and the disastrous air raid on Pearl Harbor that saw the loss of 2,343 U.S. soldiers with another 1,272 wounded, four battleships sunk, others seriously damaged, and 188 aircraft destroyed, with another 150 damaged, 
Washington decided that it would not inform the already panicked civilians of what had occurred. Still, Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall started working immediately to rectify the situation. Not that it mattered, as the Japanese Imperial Headquarters, equally, if not more so, embarrassed at the failure of Midway, tried to cover the loss of so many naval assets by touting their taking of Atu and Kiska. Eventually, these Tokyo radio broadcasts reached America, and the U.S. press picked up on the story. The military had been given another black eye. As the days and weeks went by on Kiska, the Japanese troops became lonely, and they knew that the only thing that awaited them was colder weather, which was nothing compared to what Charlie had been going through. He spent his days digging for earthworms, which he ate, along with the poochick, which was never enough. He was losing weight and strength fast. By the third week of July, having been out in the open for almost seven weeks, Charlie lost 100 pounds, and he could barely walk. Thinking of his wife and his daughter, he decided to give himself up. The Japanese might kill him, but the weather of Kiska definitely would. On July 26, 1942, Charlie slowly came down from the hills. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. The man in charge of defending the Aleutians and Alaska, was U.S. Army Major General Simon B. Buckner, Jr. In fact, as early as July 1940, the Army had sent the general to Alaska to be the new head of Alaskan Defense Command. Right away, Buckner could see that his weakness was not only Alaska in general, but more specifically, the Aleutians. As for Alaska, Buckner's job was to secure each and every harbor along the coast from invasion, and to build up the territory's roads, bridges, and airfields. Problem was, Congress only released any serious funds in the fall of 1940. The general got to work, but he worried it would be too little, too late, and he would be proven correct. Buckner said, even after Pearl Harbor, our so-publicized naval stronghold of Dutch Harbor did not have one protecting airfield within 800 miles. And the Japanese knew this, which was true enough. Chief Hodakoff of Atu had been telling the U.S. Army since 1935 that the Japanese military had been mapping the island chain. Buckner's last warning to Congress was on June 5, 1942, two days before Kiska was invaded. Going back to the second day of the air raid on Dutch Harbor, as the Japanese aircraft had been on their way to the naval facility, they flew over the island of Atka, about 331 miles or 532 kilometers west-southwest of Dutch Harbor. 
The people that lived there, near Nazan Bay, on the eastern shore, had seen both flights go over, and feared the worst. Also on the island was Ruby and Ralph McGee, who, like the Joneses on Attu, were there to send weather reports to Dutch Harbor. Ralph handled those signals. Ruby was the schoolteacher. But on that day of June 4th, the people around Nazan Bay also saw an American plane, a seaplane called a PBY, an amphibious aircraft, that must have been trying to locate the enemy's fleet. It landed in the bay, but the civilians could tell that something was wrong. The males of the village went out on their skiffs and helped the Americans to shore. The PBY had been in the air so long it had practically run out of fuel. But that was when one of the crew remembered ATCA also stored fuel for the military. While the plane's tanks were being refilled manually, the pilot talked with the McGee's. Ralph explained that the military wanted him to report even more frequently since they had not heard from Charlie on Kiska or the Joneses on a two. While the pilot replied that some of his fellow aviators were even now trying to fly over those two islands to confirm their suspicions that the Japanese had arrived. But not until June 10th, a week after the Japanese came to the Aleutians, that a break in the clouds had allowed the U.S. military to verify that the enemy was indeed on both islands and in strength. Yet on that same day, a naval spokesman told the American public that none of our inhabited islands or rocks are troubled with uninvited visitors at this time. Now, FDR knew this was not true. He had been told as such. Still, he gave the order, get those Japanese troops off of American soil, which now made this priority one. The military's response, considering the paucity of resources in the area, Rear Admiral Theobald was still far to the east, waiting to save the west coast, and also maintaining radio silence as to not give away his position, was to bomb the enemy positions on each island until they evacuated, which mattered little to the local weather. And the radar at the time was too primitive to really make a difference. More besides, the U.S. did not have enough bombers in the relative area, nor enough experienced crews, nor enough airstrips, But to top off this gloomy prospect, what planes were in the area were no match for the enemy's premier fighter, the Zero. Again, not that any of this mattered. This time, to patrol Wing 4, Captain Leslie Garez of the U.S. Navy. Garez would become known as a Mustang officer. That is, someone who rose from enlisted man to admiral's rank and it was his determination that would cut through the fog and winds to go after the Japanese. But his plan was so unorthodox and dangerous that it needed permission from a superior, the vanished Admiral Theobald. So Gares went over his head to Nimitz, who approved the plan. Gares told his pilots early on June 11th, who had just been transferred from San Diego and who already missed the warmth, that they were to dive-bomb the two Japanese positions around the clock, no matter the weather. This would continue until they either ran out of bombs or the enemy evacuated. The pilots had to have looked at each other as if to ask, is this man crazy? No, I'm not going to say it to his face, as he always seemed to be ready to start yelling, but let's go over the basics. The only planes the men had were the PBY Scout seaplanes, and though the consolidated PBY Catalina's PB stood for a patrol bomber, it couldn't defend itself against the Zeros, or much else. Its skin was thin, so no protection against enemy air batteries. It was slow, so enemy planes of various kinds could catch up to it. It had a crew of seven, so if the plane went down, and most of the planes Garris had did not have radar, so that was a strong possibility, seven men 
in one go would be lost. And lastly, though it was a bomber, it was designed to drop its two 500-pound bombs when flying level. Dive bombing had never been tried before. But that was the only way to get around the almost constant cloud cover over the Aleutians. Still, with time and training, dive bombing techniques could be worked out. But there was no time for training. The president wanted this operation, codenamed the Kiska Blitz, to start yesterday. Indeed, that same morning of June 11, 1942, some of the PBYs lifted off from Nazim Bay at Atka and made for Kiska, some 356 miles due west. As for how they would attack, that was determined on the fly, as it were, by Lieutenant Commander Carol Doc Jones. He visualized the best way to attack in a duck like the PBY was this. First, the pilots would seek out a hole in the clouds, over or near the target. Then the plane would dive through it. However, this would soon bring the plane near the speed at which, if the pilot and co-pilot tried to pull up, the wings would rip off. It was best to stay under 250 miles an hour. As the PBYs became visible to the Japanese anti-air crews around Kiska Harbor, the men below started opening up. Their bullets easily penetrated the bomb's metal skin. Right away, the air crews suffered casualties. Hence, the remaining bombers that day were told to avoid the breaks in the clouds and instead just dive through them, as this would give the Americans a few more seconds of cover. As the PBYs came through, they went after the various enemy ships in harbor. Having come down so close to the ships, many opportunities were had to shoot up the planes. Most plane crews had dead or wounded aboard when they returned, and some of the bombers did not make it back. The ones that did had holes throughout the aircraft. One in particular had so many holes, it sank after landing. As Gares had 24 PBYs, the bombing would continue. Further, he worked out a schedule so that between his own PBYs at Nazan and the Army's bombers, though located on Umnak Island, just west of Dutch Harbor, about 300 miles away, the Japanese forces were bombed almost every hour during the day. The next day, June 12th, the PBY crews were ready to go again, although fewer men were available for this go-around. Ruby was helping with the wounded as much as she could. But as it was only a matter of time before the Japanese found out where these bombing raids were originating from, the Navy thought it best to order the natives to leave the bay where they had been helping out with the crews and return to their village about three miles away. Only Ralph and Ruby McGee were allowed to stay for their skills and other duties. But even that gesture was not enough to protect the natives. For a little later that morning, June 12th, the Japanese sent out their own scout plane that soon flew over the village. The huts were shot up, but fortunately, no one was hurt. But between that and another message the Krippies picked up and sent to Nimitz that said Nazan Bay was to be bombed, the Admiral decided all non-essential personnel had to leave. The order was given at 8 p.m. that night, again June 12th. The locals had 30 minutes to gather what they could take. Further, to make sure the enemy did not benefit from landing on Atka, the village was also to be destroyed. This time, not even the McGees would be allowed to remain, who were lifted off early the next morning on June 13th on the seaplane tender USS Gillis. It was also carrying the bodies of the dead PBY crews. As the Gillis did not have the capacity to take all of the natives on board, another tender, the USS Holbert, was called in. Still early in the morning of June 13th, it carried away 62 Aleuts. Yet 21 more, who had been out fishing or hunting, were left behind. 
Not two hours later, a Japanese seaplane, called a Mavis by the Americans, flew over Atka and bombed the deserted village. Two days later, the last 21 locals on Atka were picked up. As there were additional natives on other nearby islands, the USS Delaroff, an adopted troop ship, was sent in. Though it had the capacity to carry 376, by June 17th it had more than 550 Aleuts on board. Of course, they nor the crew knew where they were going, just that this area was probably about to become another war zone, as well as occupied by the Japanese. So the Delaroff sailed east. Gary's patrol wing four kept up their bombings for a second and third day, but the fog and weather made confirmation of successful strikes nearly impossible. American newspapers wrote of various enemy ships sunk or badly damaged, which made their readers feel good, but the articles were based on nothing. The truth was, the Japanese were not the one leaving, but the Aleuts, American citizens, were. And their lives would not get much better. Indeed, 75 of them would die in the coming months and years while being held in an internment camp in Alaska. Postscript. Chief Mike Hodakoff and 42 of his tribe, taken off of Atu, were transported to Japan. During their internment, four babies would be born. By the time World War II was over, 22 of these Aleut natives would die, while 25 survived. Chief Mike was one of the dead. But, as life had been hard for these people, as prisoners, it was determined that many of them were not strong enough to return and survive on Atu. So, other arrangements were made. Forty-two years after the Aleuts returned to their villages, the U.S. government recognized that their constitutional rights had been violated. In 1988, Congress passed the Aleutian and Pribilioff Island Restitution Act, which paid $12,000 to Aleut surviving victims of the internment camps. By then, about half of the survivors had long passed away. For whatever reason, there's always been a stigma around mental health in our communities. Some people say that talking about your feelings makes you weak. But you know what? It doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. No matter what you're struggling with, you can call or text 988 Lifeline to connect with a trained crisis counselor and get the resources and support you need. No judgment, no stigma, just hope. Text or call 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline day or night. 988. Hope has a new number. <laughs> 